were in this situation because of a series of really significant earthquakes that were unexpected that happened for us here in Christchurch, the first in September 2010, and then there were three other big ones, the big one in February 2011, which basically destroyed our central city, um, and the other ones impacted more on our communities. As well as the big earthquakes, there have been thousands of aftershocks as well. Leading in those early stages is very uh, chaotic. Size and scale is you know, pretty phenomenal, but people will come to help. Like in those early stages, you don't have to do it alone, but over time, no one else will come. So the long-term stuff will sit with you. Relationship management is very important in this uh, response and recovery phase particularly with social recovery, because it requires multiple uh, par partners and partnering and people to be involved. So understanding uh, who you need to work with, why you need to work with them, who will do what, and making sure that you feel comfortable that they will deliver what they've, they've committed to, but also looking for where there are gaps and where new relationships need to be established and what your role might be in terms of connecting people up with others uh, across the system. Part of that will be about how well prepared communities are before a disaster occurs. Some communities are much more able and capable to organise themselves, they already have structures in place uh, and leaders are evident. Um, but in other communities, those leaders may disappear or new ones may emerge. And I think for government, learning and understanding how to work with community is critical. And in a disaster situation, if you're leading that work and you're based in that environment, you're a member of the community anyway. So you know what things you normally do in a community, therefore you know the sorts of things that others will want to do in a community. But I think the important thing is that government does come straight up into people's uh, face, basically, when a disaster happens. Whereas normally, you know, rules and regulations sit in the background, but you have a disaster and there's a lot of decisions and a lot of impacts, etc., that combine with both community and government. I'd also encourage you to build on existing structures, so don't always look to create and invent something new. Look to the platforms that are already there, the good successes that are associated with those, and look to then expand them and see how they need to sort of flex and adjust to be more relevant for a disaster situation. Throughout these videos, you'll hear from some of the leaders and practitioners in the psychosocial space sharing some of their strategies and key learnings after five years of navigating Canterbury through post-disaster recovery. We'll also look at how success is measured, showcasing examples of how agencies can lead and support targeted services and community-focused activities, and the way that these interconnect over time. up very early on was it's very easy to see what's happening in terms of buildings, roading and other infrastructure and businesses, but it's not necessarily so easy to see what's going on in terms of people's minds and their health and the health of their families and the robustness of their communities. So I wanted to make sure that uh, we did have a long-term strategy, that we did have shared commitment to what a number of people would be doing across the social sector and within communities, and that it was balanced so that as well as individual and targeted supports, that there was also community-led activity going on. In a disaster, the type of people that are impacted are not the people that are normally known to agencies. Middle-aged working people with children, with parents, uh, etc. Not used to asking for support, not used to receiving support, but absolutely needing it. 
So we did develop a strategy. We looked to uh, models that might be appropriate for us to use in the space that we were at. And so we used a pyramid model. At the tip of the pyramid, specialised services are available to those who require intensive help to address severe recovery needs. On the next level, targeted services address specific recovery needs amongst affected populations. Community supports assist the recovery of families within their communities. At the base of the pyramid, universal supports provide community-level messages and information enabling people to lead their own recovery, as well as supporting that of their friends and families. Early intervention at the base of the pyramid is intended to reduce demands for services at the top of the pyramid. Okay, so um, um, good afternoon. It's, it's great to be here today to announce what is a major milestone in the rebuild of Greater Christchurch. Can I Political buy-in or the understanding of uh, politicians and those that operate in that environment are very important in the social space because psychosocial recovery or the impacts of uh, health and well-being for people in a disaster situation aren't well known. And after the response phase, many people that don't live in the environment just assume that uh, people are back to the way they were before. And in fact, nobody is and it'll be years before and generations before the levels of psychosocial recovery come back to an equilibrium. So being able to have again the, the evidence base or to have an understanding and being able to articulate that story in a real way with politicians um, means that that can only be helpful for the things that are needed to be put in place locally. And in the Christchurch situation, we've been slightly fortunate because the minister that we've had responsible for the recovery also lives in Christchurch. So there is the ability to have that understanding of what that environment's like, how it plays out over time, and the impacts that that has for people. So if you find yourself in the privileged position of being responsible for leading the recovery for the people in your event and disaster, then grab that opportunity with both hands. Make sure you keep people at the centre of your thinking all the time. Wave that flag wherever you need to. People won't want to hear the things that you want to say, but you need to, because recovery won't be achieved until people can live the life that they want to. It won't be easy, it'll be a long journey, but it is one worth taking. The 0800 Canterbury Support phone line was established to provide a free calling number for all Canterbury residents seeking access to a wide range of psychosocial services and other practical supports. The immediate need that arose was the need for a single point of entry, a telephone number. There are lots of telephone numbers out there, residents were getting quite confused. So we set up the Canterbury Support line for the purpose of all citizens accessing help and uh, information around the earthquake. So it was up and running very quickly. Sandy Jenkins, Canterbury Support Line Coordinator. People could ring in, get a one-off inquiry sorted out straight away. They could be handshaken over to another 0800 line like EQC or uh, private insurance companies, city council, etc. Or they could be on referred to an appropriate social service. It could be a counselling service, it could be earthquake support coordination, it could be a, an accommodation query. The Canterbury support line wasn't targeted at traditional clients of social services. It was the universal population. They were a professional call centre team. They already had access to social services all around New Zealand. So they were well equipped to take these calls. And we had a um, communications procedure set up where we updated the call centre operative team with all of the changes that were happening often before something was going to be announced. We can certainly help find you accommodation. Um, have you got insurance cover for, to pay for your accommodation? I think the other thing that we did that was really critical 
is that we provided a follow-up service and that made a real difference. And often we picked up people who might have fallen through the cracks or they got their immediate need met, um, but in doing so something else emerged and the local person was able to triage them to uh, further support. Early on in the earthquake and the response phase, door knocking was really great at being able to identify vulnerable people and also help triage their needs um, out to the different organisations and agencies. The combined church groups have door knocked over 18,000 homes. Um, volunteers, mainly elderly too, going in and, and having a cup of tea and sitting down and talking with people who have needs. Immediately after the earthquake, um, our church, St Christopher's, decided that we needed to do something to help the people in Christchurch. And so initially we went out and helped people unstick doors and windows and tried to get some normality back into their lives while they waited for the other agencies to come in and help them. Later on in the recovery, you know, years three or four time frame, there's still people who don't identify as being vulnerable and door knocking is a really good way of getting out into the community, touching base with these people and getting the services to them. We recently visited in Burwood and came across a home that had no running toilet still and that was four and a half years after the event and there was another house there that had no electricity and no hot running water and so these people have been living with that for like four years and they don't say anything, they just put up with it. One of the, the real strengths of a door knocking program is to actually utilise the community groups that know the community that they're going to be door knocking. I think um, a couple of key lessons would be don't rush into anything. Obviously um, everything does need to be coordinated. You don't want to be suddenly going into a street that someone else had gone into two days before or something like that because that could be quite annoying to the homeowner. The mapping takes a long time to do and, and the coordination then of your volunteers so it's making sure you get that right and also making sure your volunteers have got all the information that they need so that when they talk to the homeowner they feel confident in what they're saying instead of going oh well I'm going to have to go back and ask someone that question. You've got to empower them and know that they've got the correct information in the first place. The Earthquake Support Coordination Service works alongside households requiring additional support. Skilled staff are deployed from multiple non-government organisations as well as government departments. I can remember thinking after the September earthquake that all this will be over in a few months, we'll be fine. Around us the houses looked okay, a lot of liquefaction and water everywhere but not for a minute did I think that we'd still be working with people five years down the track. The service provides coordinators who walk alongside you as a homeowner or a resident and helps you through the journey of getting your home fixed, getting you through that process to get you back to a position that you were in or better than pre-earthquakes. The beauty of this service is that because it has 15 NGOs that are providing the service, plus some government staff directly as well, they all come with different skill sets. So we have the likes of Age Concern that are used to working with older people. We have Emerge New Zealand who provides mental health services. So it can be tailored to the needs of the individuals that have contacted the service looking for help. We had door knocking. 
but we also had a very good pastoral care team that would do referrals and we made ourselves known within the district so that people could come to us. We were a good first port of call. We've had some residents who may have thought that they, they have their home for life and, and, and this process has placed them in a situation where they've had to undertake significant repairs to their home, work with insurers, work with builders, um, potentially engage with, with lawyers, move out for a period of time. All of those sorts of things um, which people weren't really set up to or thought that they were going to have to do. So our coordinators have had to support people through that process, which is sometimes quite long and complex. For those initial interviews that you're going to have at the office with the clients, you need to at least allow two hours so that you can get a really good gauge of how they're feeling. You need to give them the opportunity to repeat their story many, many times, and you need to be able to just draw out of them exactly what the problem is that they're dealing with at the time. We were there to navigate. We weren't there to do the work for them. We were there to give them different scenarios, because often people don't know what they want. It's difficult because you're not 100% clear about what the needs are going to be in three or six or 12 months time. So you need to set up a service that can be adaptable. I think looking back, the strength of the service, the fact that the service is still going today is testament to the people that set it up, to the infrastructure that we put in place to support it and the commitment of the non-government organisations that were involved and, and came together to work with government to deliver the service to people of the Greater Christchurch. One of the things about community-led recovery is that you can't go in and fix communities. If you go in on a, you know, and come in top down and try to fix things and make things better, the communities will never learn. Um, and so you need to think of ways and techniques to, to support communities to lead recovery themselves, whatever that looks like for them, um, and, and provide ways to facilitate and broker that. Initially after the earthquakes there was a, a lot of neighbourliness and you know people put their barbecues out on the on the street and everybody was checking on each other but about a year after the earthquake you really did begin to notice that there was some drop off in terms of that community care and it was around that time that Many people in the, in the local Methodist parishes were getting incredibly frustrated because they couldn't move forward and they just felt they couldn't do anything in response to the community needs. And that's really where the Summer of Fun came from. So the Anglicans and the Methodists came together with Sarah and we went to the Christchurch Earthquake Appeal Trust for funding. So that very first year I think we had $40,000 to run these 40 events over the summer period. There were a whole range of different events, uh, not just kind of your standard community fun days. You had kayaking on the river, you had sailing on the estuary, you had a whole lot of things, but the, the criteria was that it had to be open to the whole community and as much as possible had to be free to the community. There was face painting, there was candy floss, you know, there was a barbecue going, archery. Um, we, we had a bouncy castle away from the archery. Um, so that, it, it was those types of things. So they weren't, they weren't anything clever. We used local artists, so local bands would come in. They were traditional events that anybody could put on. In the second year of the Summer of Fun, when a lot more organisations came on board, we also looked at how we could support community organisations with resources. And one of those things we did was actually buy a trailer. And it's a trailer that's brightly painted with Summer of Fun on the outside and it's got barbecue in there and it's got marquees and lots of games. So a group can just actually um, book the trailer and everything's there for them. One of the great things about the Summer of Fun is that it really has allowed some grassroots community development work and neighbourhood building to happen. 
There's much stronger engagement now between different organisations in a local community, but also between neighbours. Piece of Cake is, is an opportunity in the last weekend of March to get together with your neighbours, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, in a way that works for you. And food is a great connector, we know, across all cultures. So our suggestion was just, why don't you invite your neighbours over for coffee and a cake? We got some really strong feedback from people, that they had some pleasant surprises, they got to know their neighbours. It was much easier and much more fun than they thought it would be. They, they went from being the um, neighbours who complained about uh, the noise level all the time, to good old Rob and Stacey, who were keen to help out with the trailer. A lot of people um, were inspired from that point on to, um, to go, actually we're going to have a monthly dinner with each other, we're going to connect in a stronger way because they were beginning to see the importance of connection, the importance of getting to know the people around them to build a safer community and also as a way to grieve collectively for what had happened to our city and to look at moving forward, going this is our neighbourhood and we're going to reclaim this and build it together. When a project is led by people, when they feel that they've got ownership of it, it just gives a completely different vibe. It just gives a, a lightness to it. It's an opportunity to get out, enjoy themselves, get to know their neighbours. Um, it's a great feeling. Initially the focus was on rebuilding the city and sorting the infrastructure out and making sure that people were okay physically. It came to our attention that the mental health and wellbeing of, of the people, the people themselves, wasn't really being responded to and we were aware from doing some research into this whole arena of psychosocial recovery that it can take five to ten years, if not longer, for people to recover. and that we decided we needed to do something about that. We went out and talked to people, Cantabrians, about how they actually were and what, what they would view as a, a useful messaging campaign. One of the important things we learned was that we needed to start where people were at, um, as opposed to a kind of predetermined idea of what they needed. And so we used the material that they gave us, took it to a creative agency, and asked them to come up with something that they thought reflected where Cantabrians were at right now. And so that's where the brand came from. Whatever people were feeling after the, the earthquakes, after the disaster, was actually okay. It was all right. It's all right to say that you're over it, to feel that you're over it right now. It's, it's absolutely all right. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. The real engine room of the All Right campaign, if you like, is the five ways to wellbeing, and uh, these are uh, internationally um, recognised strategies that, that promote human wellbeing. The first one being uh, connect, which is talking about social connectedness, so our, our sense of belonging and our, our, our practising of the relationships that we have. Being active, which is always good for our mental health and well-being as well as our physical well-being. Um, really great for helping us lift our mood in particular. It's about simply building in a little bit of physical activity into your everyday life. Giving, which is so the power of giving. I like to think of it as practicing kindness and that helps also build connections. Keep learning, which is kind of the mental equivalent of being active. It's just trying new things, so um, having new experiences, um, keeping your mind engaged and interested and active. And um, last but not least of the five ways is take notice or taking notice, and that's really based on mindfulness, being more present, um, being more engaged, and um, turning up for your life, you know, every day. Everything we do is about either communicating them to people or creating opportunities for them to experience those five ways. 
We have done some little social media videos and things, we call them little bursts of all right, and they're really attention grabbers, you know, they're, they're, what they are is kind of pointing out to people the power of some of the five ways to wellbeing. Often they've been based around um, acts of kindness. The most successful resource was something we called a pack of tiny adventures and this was aimed at supporting parents to have meaningful uh, quality time spent with their children. It was aimed particularly at, at sort of under fives. Our research was showing that parents were kind of wary that they weren't giving of themselves as much, you know, given that they were dealing with so many secondary stressors and, and you know, accumulated effects of the disaster. So, uh, they were conscious that they weren't there for their kids as much uh, and, and felt overloaded and it was too hard to think of uh, imaginative, creative things to do with their children. So the little uh, pack of tiny adventures made this easy. Uh, they literally are a pack of cards, they're colour coded by how much time you've got. So if you've got five minutes, that's all we've got, or you've got 15 minutes, or you've got an hour. Um, you've got a selection of simple activities um, and the best way to use them is you ask the kids to choose. It's, it's very easy for even the strongest of people to kind of lose the ability to, to really look after themselves and to forget what they used to do before the event. We didn't want to come across as the experts because we're not the experts. You know, we, we wanted to make sure that our messaging was that you are the experts, the people of Canterbury, you are the experts in your own well-being. We're just here to kind of give you a little gentle nudge to remind you of the things you already know. If we were to run this campaign again from the beginning, we would advocate for um, multi-year funding for this campaign because we've um, used a phased approach and you need time for each of the phases to kind of really embed themselves before you move on to the next phase. The other lessons are that a campaign like this shouldn't be branded with any um, government logos. It needs to look like it's slightly independent of the government because what came out of our first piece of research was that people were really frustrated with the, with the recovery, with the way the recovery was being managed. So that's why our material just has the logo of the actual campaign itself. And people haven't even asked where it came from really, they just see it out there and they go, they either like it or they don't like it, and um, really where it's come from doesn't matter to them too much. One of the things that we found is about two to three years after the first event, people were still living in damaged earthquake homes. And we were able to establish a program called Winter Make It Right, which expanded into Let's Find and Fix the next year um, to help those people resolve those issues. It involved door knocking and doing emergency repairs for them. These homes were not weather tight, um, they had sanitation issues, um, or they had heating issues and we have pretty cold winters here. So we set a program to help make those um, homes better to live in until the people got their full repairs. In order to get repairs done quickly uh, in the Let's Find and Fix program, it was essential that we had really good relationships with the insurance companies and their project management offices. They were able to get us free trades people and through our relationships with insurers and banks we got funding for all the materials uh, that were needed for the, um, the services. As the project grew, other organisations like philanthropic organisations came on board to provide funding so that we could keep the project going. The other thing that was really noticed is that they have a lot of good skill sets too uh, in those communities. So there were opportunities for groups like Men's Shed, um, which, you know, um, there's a bunch of guys who get together and do woodwork and that, who went out and did repairs for us as well. 
So using communities because they know who's in the community was essential to getting to the right people. As we were doing the um, first phase of the Winter Make It Right program, uh, we had a, a, an experienced drain layer um, on board, Glen Ratter, was really impacted quite emotionally by some of the people that he was seeing and some of the conditions that people were living in. One particular um, gentleman was a, an elderly war veteran um, who hadn't had a toilet uh, in his home for almost a year. If I recall it, I think you said that the, the neighbours had, had told you about this property. Yeah, they were complaining about the smell coming from the property um, and looking over the fence that the old boy living there by himself, he was a bit of a hoarder. I don't think he sort of knew what to, what to do or how to get any help. So, yeah, his drain was badly blocked and, and investigating, he was using a milk bottle. So he was, he was using something like this to, yeah, yeah, to he'd, actually... Yeah, he'd cut them through here, left the handle on, was sitting that in the toilet, using it, and either putting it into his red bin or just chucking it in a pile in the backyard. And how long had he not been able to use his toilet since? It had been two years. Two years he'd been doing this. Yep. Glenn had it fixed within two hours, and uh, it was kind of a, a real eye-opener for us all that um, people were out there, um, they weren't speaking up, um, they, they, they had these high needs, um, but they were very, very vulnerable still. With the Let's Find and Fix program, we were lucky in that we had a lot of existing relationships that had built up since the earthquake. Um, these were in the community sector, the governmental sector, the commercial sector, as well as with the insurers and um, Earthquake Commission and their building companies. Bringing all of those together allowed us to get a really robust program um, to the residents fast um, and to the right residents as well. Um, so it was essential to utilise all the skill sets and the knowledge and information um, that each of those parties brought that wouldn't have been able to achieve the same outcome if they tried to do it individually. The Residential Advisory Service provides free, impartial legal advice to residential property owners who are facing challenges with their insurance claim and in doing so has played an important role in assisting their psychosocial recovery. There was a need for people to assist uh, homeowners who were struggling in the rebuild or repair of their, their properties and settling their insurance claims. So there was a, a need for uh, an intervention of, of some sort to try and progress uh, those claims. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was felt that uh, providing an advisory service to these homeowners would enable them to empower themselves to move forward with their, uh, with their claims. So the RAS, as it's, as it's uh, developed, has, has got a number of arms to it. One is the legal advice, uh, the second one is we've got a technical panel that we can provide a, uh, support with, we've got uh, practical skills and, and advice and facilitation, uh, and then we have a multi-party meeting process where we interject a, a, an independent facilitator to try and negotiate uh, with the insurer EQC for an outcome. So uh, we put the customer at the centre of that to try and move that case forward. It's free, uh, it's, it's readily accessible, we, we meet people out in the community, uh, not in their homes but in community venues so it's uh, comfortable for them. Uh, and really the, the key fundamental is to empower them to move forward, uh, uh, to give them the, the skills and the abilities and the, and the information that they need to, to engage with the insurer EQC. Over the time that we've, we've been in, um, uh, in service, and it's coming up to three years now, that we've certainly learnt uh, some, some good lessons. Uh, we do need to evolve. Uh, we can't uh, give the same service offering as we did at the start uh, to what we're doing now, uh, because people are all different uh, parts of the recovery uh, process. And I think what we have seen is more uh, more moved away from the transactional activity that we had at the start, which was people come in and got some advice. 
Uh, now we're taking more on in terms of uh, representing them to the to the insurance company or p positioning their case to the to the insurance company uh, much better. Uh, and again, I think we would probably uh, have that up front uh, and support it with the, the other services that we've got, the, the legal and the technical and those uh, those other practical skills that uh, people may need just to take that forward.